Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank everyone for being here for episode three of Criminal History and Occupancy Policy, the Impact of Disparate Impact. So we are grateful for all of you who are attending today and listening in on this call. Uh, just some housekeeping items to keep in mind. Uh, there will be a recorded version available at some point in the near future. You'll be able to get that on our website and you'll be notified via email of when it is uh, ready. So make sure any emails that you receive from the Fair Housing Institute that they go to your main inbox. Sometimes they can wind up uh, in an updates folder or something else. So keep that item in mind. There is gonna be an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you do have questions, uh, they may be covered uh, through this presentation today that Kathy is gonna provide for us shortly, but there will be an opportunity. And if something isn't covered, we're gonna go through them if we have a few minutes and uh, cover those uh, together. So we look forward to your thoughts and your feedback. Uh, any feedback whatsoever, please feel free to share it via email or on our social sites. We welcome any feedback. There will be a three question survey at the end of the webinar today of our episode. And we'd love your feedback on how we're doing and future uh, episodes that we're working on for 2020. If there's any topics that you'd like to hear about, please uh, share those with us on that, on that survey. So the Fair Housing Institute, Many of you are clients. We appreciate your business very much. We're happy to announce that we've just launched a new course, Fair Housing and Seniors, What You Need to Know, and there are many more to come. So if you haven't taken a look at our, at our Fair Housing uh, catalog, be sure to do that on our website, fairhousinginstitute.com, and reach out to us if you have any more questions at all. So let's uh, get into our session for today. But first of all, Let's uh, warmly welcome Kathleen Williams. And she's a partner of the law firm of Williams and Edelstein and is the president of the Fair Housing Institute. And uh, the Fair Housing Institute is a full service training and consulting firm that will assist you with training either online or in person on fair housing topics and education. Kathy represents the housing industry excuse me, housing industry clients throughout the country on fair housing and other civil rights matters. So Kathy, wanna welcome you today. Thank you, Jonathan, delighted to be here. Awesome, so here's what we're gonna be talking, out, talking about today. Uh, some very specific topics, uh, HUD's new regulations. What do they mean? Are they gonna provide relief or anxiety? Uh, what, what, what should you expect? So Kathy's got some updates on what's in the horizon for us. Uh, occupancy policies and criminal history policies. What do those look like? We're gonna have a couple of polls. We'd love your feedback. What can you do to make sure that you're in compliance and you can protect yourself as an organization from any potential fair housing uh, litigation? Now keep in mind, we mentioned this in every one of our episodes, this is an educational session. There is no certificate of completion. And even more important, this is not legal advice. Uh, if there's any need for changes, uh, you need to consult uh, legal counsel. So just notice that final sentence, do not change process or policy without proper authority and change in all places such as policy, manuals, leases, and et cetera. So just uh, keep those particular <coughs> points in mind. So let's get into our, our first uh, part of our uh, session today, and that's what's on the horizon. So Kathy, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Jonathan, and, um, and welcome to everybody. <clears throat> the session that we're going to be covering today is uh, somewhat legalistic, and I apologize for that, but there's just not getting around that when we talk about this topic, which is disparate impact. Uh, let, let's begin by um, explaining what we mean by disparate impact. Um, under the Fair Housing Act, 
there are two ways to prove a case of housing discrimination uh, that a plaintiff can use. And by the way, the plaintiff in our uh, environment are usually uh, the residents, sometimes the applicants, um, and other times maybe some, an advocacy organization that might sue you based on what they think is a fair housing violation. A, a defendant is usually a resident, uh, an applicant, and I'm sorry, the, the plaintiff is a resident or applicant, and the defendant is, of course, your property, uh, your management company, your owner. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we when we are going to be talking about who makes a claim um, in, under disparate impact. <clears throat> the most common type of allegations of housing discrimination are made under the first method of proving a case, and that's called disparate treatment. That's the one you're very familiar with. Uh, the idea is person A is treated inconsistently to person B, and the allegation is that's because of that person's race or national origin or other protected category. Then we also have this second way that we're focusing on today, and that's disparate impact. Disparate impact is a very different case. It is a claim that uh, you have developed and are enforcing a policy and the policy is very neutral. The policy uh, does not, on its face, attempt to discriminate against anybody. In fact, there doesn't even need to be an intent to discriminate. But when the policy is implemented, it does have, at least the allegation is, it has a negative or um, unfair impact or effect against an applicant or a resident. So that's the difference in um, the way these cases go, and we're talking now today about disparate impact. These cases are very complicated, and um, there's just no way, there's no getting around that. But I thought I'd real briefly try to explain how the burden of proof swings back and forth when this kind of allegation is made. So we begin with the plaintiff. Uh, the plaintiff has the burden of getting the case started. And to do that, the plaintiff has to identify a specific proper or a specific policy that your property has. And then the plaintiff has to show that that policy is going to have a disparate effect on the protected category. versus another population. They're very expensive and very technical kind of cases. So if the plaintiff is able to do that, that kicks off the case. They haven't won yet, but they've certainly got a strong beginning. Now the burden shifts, in our case, the housing provider. Well, the burden of the housing provider is to show that whatever that challenged policy is, is absolutely necessary to achieve a substantial, legitimate, and non-discriminatory interest that the property has. Um, so this is where they have to prove why this policy is so important to how they operate that they have to keep this policy as a part of their business practice. If the defendant does that, then under the shifting burdens of proof, we shift back to the plaintiff. Um, and if the plaintiff then moves forward by showing that, okay, we'll accept that this is an important policy, but we can show a number of different you could have accomplished your purpose with 
without eliminating so many people. So we can have a policy, but the policy needs to be much more narrow, and that still would accomplish your purpose without a limit, or in our case, reducing. If the plaintiff is successful on that third rung or third uh, shifting of the burden, then the plaintiff will win the case. If the plaintiff is unable to show a different policy that would still accomplish the purpose, um, then in that case, the defendant will win. So that's how, as we talk about the topic coming up now, we're going to be thinking about why it's important you can justify the policy that your property, your company uses. Okay, very good. Hey, Kathy, we've had a, just a couple glitches with audio um, on your end. It kind of was cutting in and out a little bit. So I don't know if there's something you can, you can see from over there. Uh, and so everyone who you lost audio for a bit, the, there will be a, a transcript of today's session too. So fear not, there's a, if you missed a couple points, you will have access to uh, the full transcript of, of today's session, okay? Apologize for that, you gotta love technology. Sometimes it's a, it's a beautiful thing and once in a while it can be a, a little bit of a pain. So uh, anyway, good, that's awesome, Kathy, thank you. Um, all right, so I guess you're gonna cover now some some particular items that may be on the horizon for us. Kathy? Am I being heard? There we go. Now I can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not quite sure what that could be. Um, but I will turn up myself louder and forgive me if it sounds like I'm shouting at you. No, it's um, okay. So I, I was just saying that um, HUD has recently announced that it was revising the federal regulations that it, um, set forth in 2013 about this idea of disparate impact. Um, I, the, the reality is um, HUD's regulations, original regulations, came before the Supreme Court case on this topic that came out in 2015. That court case, by the way, is often referred to as inclusive communities. That very long detailed decision uh, got to be pretty famous in the area of fair housing because for the first time the Supreme Court acknowledged that disparate impact is a legitimate method of proving housing discrimination. And then it went on to, in some details, explain the limitations of the use of disparate impact and what would be necessary for the plaintiff to prove and what would be necessary for a defendant to defend itself. When the HUD uh, announced that it was going to uh, revise its regulations, there was a lot of um, a notification about that that came out from a lot of the housing associations and got a lot of questions stirred up. So I thought the first thing I would do is just address the, at least what looks like now, will be revisions on disparate in that. <clears throat> what they do in their current form is clarify what burden the, the plaintiff has on it to make a case. And it is a strong burden. It is not going to be easy for any plaintiff to make a case against you uh, based on disparate impact. The regulations also, and I think they do a good job in clearly explaining what 
role the defense has to be able to rebut an allegation of disparate impact. So in that way, these proposed regulations are much clearer and in a way much better for the housing industry just because they will make it clear that that we can defend ourselves if challenged. Mm -hmm. And they also will make it clear to the plaintiffs that if they want to file one of these cases, they have a pretty big hurdle to get over in their proof. So how does that affect, uh, I guess, data like and maintaining data, retaining data? What, uh, any comments on requirements along those lines, Kathy? Well, the, these regs do make it clear that nobody has to maintain racial data or data on any of the protected categories to be able to defend itself. Now, if you get charged, if you get uh, a case against you, you're going to want to go out and uh, obtain that kind of information, but you don't have to keep it, you don't have to maintain it on a regular basis. And for most of you who operate uh, in the multifamily world, of course, uh, in private market housing, you don't keep track of uh, uh, ethnic or racial um, uh, data on your mm -hmm. residents. Now, in the world of federally funded housing, uh, those management agents have to keep that data and, um, and, and provide it to the government when they're requested. Um, one limitation on any rule that HUD ends up adopting is that it really can't, HUD does not have the authority to change the law as it was set forth in uh, inclusive communities. So um, they, I think these regulations do what they can and uh, don't get carried away with trying to actually make a change in, in what uh, the legal requirements are. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So lots of things. Uh, and again, sorry, friends, for the uh, little audio issues. We will have some, you'll be able to get the transcript in here. A lot of things on the horizon. So great summary, uh, Kathy. And that kind of leads us now into our, our next topic, which is criminal history screening. Now, we, this is one of those items that is a lot more of a sensitive topic, especially when we look in the news today and it, everything is very heated when it comes to anything related to uh, race, or ethnic background. And so in the housing industry, we know we have to maintain uh, equality no matter what. So what an important topic on what we do and how we set policy when it comes to criminal history screening. So what are you seeing, Kathy? And uh, what can all of us on the call today uh, think about and institute as best practices? Well, criminal history screening is one of several topics that are being challenged under this concept of disparate impact. And that's why I wanted to focus on this and occupancy today. Um, to begin to understand why criminal history screening policies are the focus of disparate impact claims, we need to look at where we get criminal history screening data. Uh, we go to our screening companies usually, and they look at county and state and federal criminal justice data. And um, then we make our decisions accordingly. The facts show indeed that historically, minorities in this country, and in particular African Americans, have been um, arrested, prosecuted, tried, and sentenced at a much higher rate for a much longer time than whites. And indeed, I think the statistics, when you look at the studies, and there have been many studies done, 
<clears throat> that confirm that our criminal history uh, data and uh, criminal history process in this country has not been consistent, has not been fair. So any policy that a housing provider has that relies on that data can be challenged as having a negative or a discriminatory impact. African Americans and probably Hispanics, but predominantly, I think, African Americans. Um, therefore, the policy is automatically, whatever it is, however it's written, is probably going to have a discriminatory impact. And that's why we have to talk about justifying those policies. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. So I think that brings us to our first poll. So let's put that up on the screen for everyone. Okay, can everybody see that poll? All right, thanks for getting the answers coming in now, Kathy. And then we'll put the results up on the screen for you. So what is the criminal history policy for your property? Choose all that apply. Thank you for your votes. It's gonna be interesting to see what the, the final tally are. So far at the moment, every one of the questions is neck and neck overall. Okay, we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds. And then we're gonna put the, the results up on the screen here. Okay, so let's uh, share the results. Everybody should be able to see that now. All right, hey, Kathy, any, any comments on the results, what you see there? Yeah, you know, those are interesting, and I think it's good that um, we can all see that we have all kinds of policies out there. Mm -hmm. um, the one that has the, I guess that was the most common in the responses was the fourth one. And that is probably um, a very, very safe uh, policy to have and justify. Um, the one at the top, any felonies will cause rejection. Uh, and I'm about to explain why that is going to be almost impossible to defend if it ever gets challenged. Got it. Got it. Okay, very good. Well, thank you everyone for participating in that poll. All right, what's next, Kathy, on, on the list here? All right, so um, the idea of um, your criminal history policy, to be able to justify it, since as I said, it probably could be shown to have a disparate impact. So now we have to, if you remember, um, the um, housing provider has to show that this is absolutely an essential policy that they need to be able to do a good job operating their business. And uh, we can do that, I think, by showing that the idea of criminal history screening is to try to avoid uh, applicants who then become residents and could in a reasonable belief system, turn out to be maybe a dangerous resident or a problem resident. Um, and so the policy has to be written with that overall purpose in mind. And it cannot be just real simplistic that mm -hmm. says, if anyone's had any contact with the criminal justice system, and in other words, if they've ever had a conviction, they can't live here. Uh, because that, when you think about it, is a very broad statement to make about applicants. 
So here's some, the next couple of slides give just some general ideas of what to think about when you look at and review your own criminal history policy. First of all, the more simple, the more blanket they are, probably the more risky they are to fall victim to a, a, a claim of disparate impact discrimination. Um, the policy should uh, try to achieve its basic purpose without being overly restrictive. Uh, and a, if you've ever been convicted, you can't live here is very, very restrictive. It's going to just automatically eliminate a very large number of people. Um, and so to show that the policy is thoughtful, that it was crafted to be the least restrictive, is the way to do that is to break out crimes based on their seriousness, their, their violent uh, nature, and then attach various look back uh, periods to those crimes. And a look back period is the time between the conviction date and the application date. That is what we talk about when we talk about look back period. Mm -hmm. So the first rule is you should not be denying housing to someone based only on arrest records. So even though sometimes we're concerned that if someone's been arrested multiple times, even if they have not been convicted at all, we might consider that that person is dangerous or uh, not the kind of resident you want at your property. Uh, but that, is, that kind of rule is impossible to defend because a, an arrest isn't a conviction. An arrest doesn't prove anything. So if you have an arrest listed in your policy, you might want to consider removing them. Um, now, if someone has been arrested fairly recently, when you get their application and it shows up on their record, and they've been indicted or charged with that crime, and if convicted, that, con that conviction would make them ineligible for your property one way to deal with this is to put their application on hold, be not rejected, but don't finalize it until that outstanding issue has been resolved one way or the other. Um, by the way, if, if your property is HUD funded, HUD does have a couple of requirements that you have to follow along the lines of criminal screening, for instance, uh, you cannot house anybody that's listed on a state lifetime sex offender registry. Um, and if you do public housing, uh, you can't house anybody that's ever been convicted of uh, manufacturing methamphetamine. So those type of uh, requirements should, con should continue and um, do are not affected by anything we're talking about today. Okay, awesome. Yeah, somebody was asking about some HUD items, and yes, for everyone who's asking questions, we're going to be getting into policies, I think, coming up in the next couple of, of slides, right, Kathy? Yeah, so um, we're going to be talking, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of um, suggestions um, for um, consideration in your policy. First of all, regardless of what your policy is, I think it is made much stronger, much easier to defend if you attach an appeal process to it, meaning that if a applicant is rejected uh, because of criminal history, you give that applicant the right to make an appeal back to your company or your property, wherein the applicant can try to explain mitigating circumstances that may change your mind about whether they are um, a potentially dangerous resident or not. Uh, be aware that if you do that, um, that is favored by the law, not disfavored. Sometimes I've had clients who have come back to me and say, but 
if we do that, aren't we treating people differently? Is that not not is that not inconsistent that I would let this guy in and keep that guy out for maybe the same crime? And what I can say to you is while consistency absolutely is important in fair housing, there are several areas where you are being um, almost required uh, to at least consider uh, taking individual situations into account when you make decisions. Certainly, reasonable accommodations, as you all know, is one of those. And now what we are saying is criminal history is another where there may be uh, mitigating circumstances that may change your mind and as a result you do admit someone. That doesn't mean you have to after hearing an appeal. That just means you would give it a good faith consideration. Another area that I think you all need to be aware of is regardless of what your policy says, if you are relying on a third party screening company to tell you whether an applicant's uh, criminal history either violates or satisfies your policy, you need to make sure that your criminal history screening company is applying your policy correctly because the housing provider is going to be liable for any mistakes made by your screening company in this regard. And, you know, I have a good friend, Linda Richer, who works with Amrant, um, a top screening company, and she has come to be my go-to authority on the various um, limitations that screening companies have um, by state law. Uh, and, for example, I think there are maybe four states that limit a look-back period for criminal history purposes to seven years. Now, I am always forgetting what those states are, but Linda, if you are out there today, um, I'd love it if you would share those with us, maybe as a chat, so that we can just remind our audience um, that in those states, you're gonna be very limited to the criminal background you can get on um, people. Yeah, she did. Thank you, Linda, for doing that. So Linda's comment, uh, Kathy, was the states are California, New Mexico, and New York. Convictions limited display for seven years. Colorado is five years for most convictions. So yeah, thank you for that uh, info, Linda. And that will be part of the show notes to everyone is a white paper from Amrent regarding that particular topic. So look forward to that at the, on the recorded version of today's uh, episode, okay? Yeah, thanks, Linda. And I really appreciate uh, learning from you about all these various state laws because I think um, property management companies need to be better educated about what their um, limitations are when they do screening. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Linda. All right. So, comments on how to model policy. What do you think, uh, Kathy? Oh, well, um, you know, first of all, I begin by separating uh, felonies from misdemeanors. Um, I don't think you need to cover all felonies, and I don't think you need to cover all misdemeanors, but at least, uh, the very least, your look back period should be longer for a felony than a misdemeanor. And, mm -hmm. and again, remember the look back period is from the date of the conviction to the date of application. Um, there may be, and, and Doug, I saw your question as I just glanced out here. Uh, there may be times when you may also be interested in how long it's been since this applicant has been out of prison. Um, you can have your screening company uh, get that information and they'll have to tell you whether they can get it or not, but you can include that in your policy. For instance, I have quite a few clients who, as a part of their criminal screening policy, have that the applicant must have been out, released from prison for at least one year. Other companies use two years uh, with the idea that um, 
if they've been able to interact in society uh, appropriately and without further crimes during since their release, then that gives you a little bit of time uh, to have that uh, ability to, to judge how they're doing since they were released. So that's something you can include in your policy. Mm-hmm. Um, focus primarily on the crimes that could indicate this applicant could pose a danger. Um, Now, some policies that I've seen have what I would call an outright ban. In other words, if you've ever been convicted of these crimes, you can't live here, no matter when it was, you were convicted. If you're going to use that, and I don't know that I, you know, again, I'm not giving you legal advice, but I think any of those crimes that you list as a ban does slightly raise your risk. Uh, if challenged of justifying the policy. So I would keep those to the bare minimum of the most, what we could think of as heinous crimes, uh, felony convictions. Um, Also, don't forget in your policy to address multiple felony convictions. So um, what I'm talking about with, with this is multiple different crimes, different instances, different dates of crimes. Um, It is possible to be convicted of a crime and within that crime you have four different felony counts. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a crime committed this year, an entirely different crime committed a year from now, and if the pattern of, of a number, multiple crimes, Um, appears that you just can't keep yourself out of trouble, then that is the very type of applicant you are probably wanting to keep out of your property with your criminal history policy. Absolutely. (laughs) You know, when we talk about the various kinds of crimes, there, you know, there are so many crimes and, and different states have different definitions of crime. So you have to take that into account too. So I would not try to cover every crime uh, possible. I would cover the important ones, the, the ones that give you the most pause, certainly sex offenses. And there are a variety of sex offenses. There are, you know, there's rape, there's sexual assault, there's sex offenses against children. Um, there's so many different types of sex offenses. So you wanna make sure that however your policy addresses those, it is broad and general enough to not uh, eliminate some that you maybe thought you wanted to include. Uh, Again, sometimes using more narrow language in this area might not be a good thing um, because you might want to cover all sex offenses against adults and children or just against children or however you address it. Um, And of course, you want to address violent felonies. Um, There are four, in most states, four different counts of homicide. They are all very different. Um, First degree homicide is, you know, seen as maybe the worst. Um, And third and fourth degree homicide, it's usually one of those is usually a a, a homicide, a murder or a, a killing that occurred in a traffic accident. I don't know that you want to use that or address as long a look back period for something like that than you would maybe first or second degree murder. So that's another thing you've got to both consider in your policy and make sure that your screening company can identify what kind, what count of homicide or murder was involved in a conviction. Robberies and burglary, Um, burglary particularly Um, is a serious, potentially violent crime because it's usually done with a weapon uh, in in mind or uh, in place. So that's something you probably need to address. Um, And then, you know, when we talk about look back periods, I'll just mention that seven years is probably um, the gold standard as far as, again, we're talking defense here, being able to defend yourself. And that's because 
um, there have been criminal justice studies that show that after seven years, uh, statistically, um, a ex-offender who it has gone beyond uh, seven years after release uh, is uh, no more likely to commit a, a, another crime than anyone, including people who have never had a conviction. Um, so seven years is golden. Uh, I think it's easy to push that up to 10 and still be fairly safe in um, your criminal history policy. Uh, going beyond that is not impossible. I'm just saying that it raises your risk if challenged in a disparate impact lawsuit. So after you cover the major, most concerning felonies, you may want to include other felonies. You know, there's felonies for bad check writing and felonies for um, just about any, you know, activity you can think of, computer violations and stalking. And um, so you have to kind of take a look at that and decide whether your policy should include other felonies. And it can, uh, but then I would have a much less look back period for those. Three years, five years, something like that. Um, and don't forget there are violent misdemeanors. You should definitely address those in your policies. Uh, less than the felonies, but violent misdemeanors are still a violent action. So it could be even five years, for instance. And again, I'm just throwing these years out. There is no bright line right or wrong well there are wrong ways to do it <laughs> i yeah. just can't say there's one right way to do it <laughs> right. right um Ooh, did I go and then multiple misdemeanors don't forget those just like um the multiple um felonies and you need to address uh, domestic abuse because certainly that is something that as housing providers we are all getting much more um, sensitive about That leads us to drugs. Um, and by the way, I wouldn't waste your time covering all misdemeanors. I just don't think they're that important for your applicants or your properties. Uh, drugs are a matter of concern, obviously. Um, the Fair Housing Act gives pretty broad leeway to housing providers to determine whatever policies they choose on drugs. Um, I think it makes sense to uh, divide cases between people who have had convictions, either felonies or misdemeanors, for manufacture or distribution. They were making it and they were selling it. And in a way, that is a more serious crime, maybe, depends on how you look at it, than use or possession. So you might want to divide them out like that. Some, some screening companies use drug offense one, two, three, four, kind of to do that. Um, and then finally, all drug offenses do not have to be treated the same. And there's an argument today for maybe why they shouldn't be. So if your screening company can tell you that that offense was for uh, use of marijuana, uh, you could certainly have a much lower look back period for that than use of methamphetamines or crack cocaine or one of the other more serious drugs. Right. So you and I were talking about this, Kathy, earlier today. Would you recommend that, especially since on the topic of marijuana, a lot of things are changing potentially on, on a state level, on a local level. Uh, is that something that property management companies would have to maybe make an adjusted policy, perhaps by location? Is it, what, what, what would be your, your comment on that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would certainly think that's something to take into consideration. Um, if your state, for instance, uh, says that, you know, recreational marijuana use is not illegal, I think your criminal history policy should reflect that. Um, so, yeah, I think definitely um, you would take that into consideration when creating your policy. Okay, awesome. 
All right, so we're about 45 minutes into our program, and that brings us to our concluding topic, uh, and that has to do with occupancy policies. Uh, so, and it, by the way, great coverage on, on criminal screening, and I'm sure everyone on the call today, uh, you were riveted, because there was a lot of notes more than likely you had to take, and some intriguing items that you have to pay attention to and, and take back to your team. So moving into occupancy policies, what are some uh, items, Kathy, that we need to pay attention to? What do we need to uh, implement to make sure that we're uh, in compliance with fair housing laws? Well, this is the second topic that is commonly used um, in disparate impact cases to challenge housing providers neutral policy. Um, this one's a little different, obviously, because the uh, protected category that may be uh, have a negative impact on with your occupancy policy is families with children. It is families with children that usually live together in a group and the household may be made up of two, three, four, five, six or more people. And again, most of the time, that is a family with children. So an occupancy policy is almost always going to restrict at a higher rate families with children than maybe the opposite, which is what? Um, single people who live alone, let's say. Okay. Um, and so that's why sometimes we see these cases being filed. Again, while a, a statistical uh, imbalance is not a slam dunk with families with children and occupancy policies, maybe the way it is with criminal screening and uh, uh, racial imbalance, um, there's still a concern that, that it might be able, the statistics might be there to show that. So just like with criminal screening, it's important your occupancy policy um, be protected, be defended as something that is a, a significant, legitimate, and non-discriminatory uh, policy to achieve your business interests. Okay. I think that leads us into our next poll. And thank you for the tech support on the chat. Someone mentioned about pop-up blockers and things along that line. Some of you weren't able to see the poll. Um, so I'm putting it up now. I'm going to read it out to everyone. We'll leave it up for about a minute or so. So the question is, what do your occupancy policies include? Choose all that apply. We've got a few selections, no occupancy limits, two persons per bedroom, two heartbeats per bedroom, two plus one, policy does not count infants, policy expands number if unit has den or loft, and then an other column. So we'll give everyone a, another 30 seconds or so. And, uh, and thanks again for all the, the chat everyone. Everyone's sharing some nice thoughts, some articles, and some tips. Uh, a lot of the questions, I, it, it seems from the questions and answers are being, uh, I think, Kathy, you've covered already. So we'll see what, uh, when we get towards the end, what, what we need to still cover in that area. Okay. And while, while we're waiting for the poll answers, let me just mention, uh, when I was talking about criminal history screening uh, and uh, the topic of marijuana, I, that was not in any way uh, suggesting whether you should permit marijuana use on your property or not. That's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I saw a few questions pop up in discussion there. So thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so we're going to end the poll and going to share the results. And so uh, it looks like 6% say no occupancy, 47% two persons per bedroom, 15% two heartbeats per bedroom, 19% two plus one, 14% policy does not count infants, 13% policy expands number if unit has dent or loft, and 18% is other. Wow, all over the board there, except for the two persons per bedroom. Yeah. That would seem to be the most popular one. 
Yeah, that that's very interesting. I I think it's good for everyone to know that um, companies handle occupancy in all kinds of ways, and the fact that you use a two person per bedroom uh, policy um, is not necessarily uh, safe, uh, but it it shows you that that is the industry standard. That certainly is the most common one, but there are lots of other options too that I'll talk about in just a minute. Yeah. Thank you everyone for uh, participating in that uh, poll. So let me take it off the screen here. Oops, sorry, Kathy, went too far ahead. There we go. Okay, take it away. Okay, so um, first of all, I wanna mention that anybody, any property that, any company that has an occupancy policy needs to take the time to research what the applicable uh, state and local codes are that include an occupancy provision. Now, that doesn't mean you have to adopt it. I'm just saying you need to know what it is and you need to know how it's stated because if your occupancy plan is challenged, that is the first thing the advocacy groups will go to. So you need to know what's out there and not be surprised by that. Um, and just like with criminal history screening, uh, you need to be able to justify the policy that you have, that you use as being important to your business and not unnecessarily restricting occupants from your property. So you have to think through how to do that. Okay, so what are some thoughts then, Kathy, on like, how do you implement that? What are your, any suggestions on what would be some best practices along that line? Yeah, so first of all, let me, let me mention this heartbeat. <laughs> That's the reason we asked that on the poll. You do not want to have any occupancy policy that talks about heartbeats. Um, and all, all I can say to that is, if you have a pregnant woman with triplets, how many heartbeats is that in that unit? <laughs> you do not want to get into that kind of detail. You just want to talk about people, okay? Um, how many people in your unit and, and forget the heartbeats. Um, the most common uh, occupancy policy is two persons per bedroom. Historically, that's what the industry has used. I think uh, in, in, in this day and age, with the um, how common disparate impact cases have become that in private market housing, a two per bedroom standard is somewhat risky. Um, and so I would just throw out there for your consideration ways that you can perhaps expand that policy, make it a little more open to families with children, for instance. Um, some properties have adopted, and we had we showed that on the poll, two persons per bedroom plus one. And what that means is uh, two persons per bedroom plus one additional person per unit. Those policies would result in a, a one bedroom would permit three people, a two bedroom would permit five people, and so on. That just in and of itself, uh, and you can run the numbers on your units uh, may not result in an excessively overcrowded situation and may show that you are being more uh, expansive and less restrictive when it comes to families with children. Another idea that could be adopted with uh, a two plus one or with a two per bedroom is not counting infants and you need to exactly say what an infant is. Most policies say either 12 months or under or 24 months or under, with the idea that in, for instance, in a one bedroom, a child of that age could live in the parent's bedroom and um, comfortably without creating additional problems with overcrowding. So that is another way of expanding your policy. Um, I would note uh, that in HUD-funded housing, I would be very careful about adopting any policy except two per bedroom, and that's because HUD views a 
three person and a one bedroom uh, household as overcrowding that uh, unit. So unless HUD changes its rules in its handbook, um, I would be very cautious about expanding um, your policy. Um, and also as you're thinking about the various uh, policies you could have, remember that this is really about families with children. So if you wanna have a separate policy for roommates, uh, if you're in a college uh, area, for instance, and you do not want, for instance, three people in a one bedroom, if they're roommates, you can do that. You can have a, a standard that applies to an all adult household and a different standard that applies to a household with children, as long as the household with children standard is more expansive, is uh, less restrictive than the, uh, than the policy you have for adult households. Mm -hmm. A lot of people try to justify their two per bedroom standard based on a very old memorandum that came out of HUD in the early 90s. Um, that memorandum did say that in many circumstances, a two per bedroom policy will be deemed considered as reasonable under the Fair Housing Act. Um, nowadays, things have changed. And HUD is not reviewing and not accepting a two per person standard as reasonable. Instead, it is looking at the special considerations that are listed in that memo. And those considerations were the size and layout of a unit, the extra rooms that might exist in some, especially private market units, the lofts and uh, dens and libraries, things like that and also the age of children. And the way they look at this is usually, uh, do you permit, for instance, in infants to not be counted as a person when you are uh, tallying up the number of people in a household? Um, again, um, as you're looking at all of this, take a look at those local and state codes that apply. Some of them will apply, some of them won't and then be able to justify how your policy fits in with those codes. Those codes are made on, as I mentioned, a square foot basis. Uh, basis. And so they may not exactly um, be identical to your uh, occupancy policy, and that's okay. You just need to know um, what, how to compare and contrast those. Okay, awesome. You might get some relief from your state laws. Um, for instance, Indiana has passed a law about what's deemed reasonable for occupancy in the state of Indiana. So, um, and there are other states, by the way, like that. So don't forget to look at state law to see if, and your, and your apartment association ought to be able to tell you that, um, to see if you get any uh, assistance, support for your policy uh, from there. And um, when you are justifying an occupancy policy, we really have to put some numbers to the paper, although I guess nobody uses paper nowadays. But what you need to do is, what are the costs of overcrowding? What are the costs to your parking lot, having too many cars, your sewer, water, and other utilities uh, and the demand on those from overcrowding. And of course, things like the when you turn over units, how often do you have to uh, replace the carpet and do painting? And, and does it make a difference if there are two people or six people in that unit to make those decisions? And then the burden of 500 other people living on your property and using your amenities. So there are ways of evaluating the cost of overcrowding, and that is about the best defense you can have when you're supporting your occupancy policy. And you don't want your one or two bedroom units to look like this. That would be my final thought of the day. <laughs> classic movie, classic, classic movie. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Kathy. That was uh, incredible. Um, a lot of information. We want to thank everyone for being here today. Kathy, did you have a, a concluding statement to kind of wrap up the webinar? Or did you want me to go into what's going to be available after the conclusion of the webinar today? 
Yeah, I think my my overall suggestion would be, uh, you know, take a look at these policies with uh, disparate impact in mind and see if you want to keep the same policy or see if maybe it needs to be revised and then get about doing so um, just in case. 